On this video, I examine the work of several fellow content creators. This is not an attack on the people, it's an attack on the argument. I salute these YouTubers and hope that at the end of this video, you'll check out the links in the description and if you like their channels, subscribe. Ancient people couldn't see blue. This really is an astonishing fact, or it would be if it were true, but it isn't true. It's utterly false. So why is it literally everywhere? Not only are there numerous YouTube videos that perpetuate this myth, with millions of collective views, it's in all sorts of science blogs and articles, Science Alert, Business Insider, Daily Mail, ASAP Science, and many, many more. On this video, we'll thoroughly debunk this notion that ancient humans couldn't see blue through a complete examination of the material culture of ancient civilizations. We'll discuss classical languages and the way they expressed color, including blue. We'll explain why classical Greek writers like Homer utilized color in their descriptions in what may appear to be a peculiar way, by connecting ancient Greek with modern languages, but also Old Norse, classical Latin, all the way back to Proto-Indo-European, and the birth of color within human linguistic systems. Finally, we'll be exploring the very core of color perception and its illusions, using the mathematical relationship that define the color spaces physiologically perceived in human vision, to explain the usage of color terminology in ancient cultures, and why they differ from ours. Most of these videos and articles have three main structural problems which we shall address in extreme detail today. One, they use a specific test on the Himba, a population in Namibia, Africa, as one of the basis of their argument, without knowing that the results of said test were famously tampered with and grossly exaggerated by the BBC. I'll read to you the actual statements from the experts involved on section 11. Two, they mention the ancient Greek writer Homer's description of a wine-dark sea. In other words, the fact that Homer doesn't describe the sea as being blue, but rather wine-dark coloured, and they use this, among other things, as proof for the Greeks not having a word to describe blue and perhaps not being able to even see it. 3. They use the supposed rarity of the color blue in nature, together with the fact that, oftentimes, the blue we see in animals is not a pigment, but rather a sensory illusion, known as structural coloration, as a way to reinforce the statement that it's not really blue, so there isn't really that much blue around us, hence ancient civilizations didn't have a word for it, and as a result, they couldn't even see it. As we will see, the first two points are easily debunkable. The third point is absolutely irrelevant. I only need one specific bird to completely destroy the entire section about animals not being actually blue. The raven, because of its description in Old Norse, on section 13. Ancient cultures didn't see blue. Why is the sky blue? It's one of the most common questions asked by both kids and adults, unless you're from ancient Greece. To people of the ancient world, like the Greeks, blue wasn't a color at all. What lies at the base of all this is the fundamental question, does language influence perception? Do we see reality through the patterns laid down by our mental linguistic structures? The question is relevant in the framework of the topic under consideration, but as you will see shortly, some of the statements made in these videos and blogs are plain wrong, such as the following one. William Gladstone, a four-time Prime Minister of Great Britain, Gladstone wondered if Homer was colorblind. Gladstone, he believed the Greeks of at least Homer's age were in fact colorblind. William Gladstone never said that. I'll show you what he actually did say on section 6. I mean, for a colour the ancients didn't even have, they surely liked putting it everywhere, didn't they? There is polychrome in ancient wall painting, architecture, clothing, figural painting, pottery utensils and ornaments in ancient Greece. And that includes blue. I mean, did you look at the Minoans? Blue is in the artwork, on their buildings, on the makeup of their women. Not to mention the fact that it also had funerary connections in their culture. Now, how a colour they couldn't even see had very well established funerary connections is beyond me. On these videos, they do mention that the ancient Egyptians did have a word for blue and did create the so-called Egyptian blue. However, they use that as the exception. The ancient Egyptians had it, no one else did. But they fail to mention that Egyptian blue was very popular, guess where? in the entire Mediterranean world, because of maritime trade. 
Egyptian blue had been used in Greece for a very long time as indicated by the Knossos pigments we shall discuss in the next section. Furthermore, production of Egyptian blue spread to Mesopotamia, Persia, Greece and Rome. The Romans built factories to produce the blue pigment they knew as Caeruleum. We have the description of the manufacture of a blue pigment, which is clearly Egyptian blue frit, given by Vitruvius at the beginning of the 1st century BC in the Books of Architecture. In addition, there is also the description of the Roman navy in Britannia made by Vegetius, and he tells us that the Romans dyed the tunics of the soldiers in the navy and painted their boats and ships the same color as the ocean, blue, so that they would be less visible. In other words, blue was a sort of early tactical camouflage for the Romans. Of course, the relationship to colour of a person changed depending on the level of development of the material culture. Cavemen didn't have the means to express blue artistically, but that didn't mean that they couldn't see it. And now get ready for the kicker. Not only Egyptian blue was available in Greece, but it wasn't the only blue the Greeks had access to. <laughs> hey, don't hold it against me if the next section blew your mind. Several cities flourished in Greece during the Bronze Age, in particular the centres of Gnosos, Mycenae, Pylos, Thera, and numerous wall paintings and murals have been uncovered. Samples of blue pigment from excavated wall paintings have been analysed by non-destructive methods, namely X-ray fluorescence, X-ray diffraction and mineralogical microscopic examination, it took me 10 takes to say them right, and the results show two types of blue pigment used. Egyptian blue, which confirms the fact that it was imported through trade, and glaucophane, a sodium magnesium or iron aluminium hydroxide silicate, which occurs as a natural mineral in Crete and Thera. The usage of this glaucophane pigment as a prominent constituent in Minoan art is unquestioned. Now check this out. Question. Thera. Did you notice I put emphasis on it during my explanation? Thera is an ancient Greek city where? Santorini. You'd think the country that is now ubiquitously known for beautiful blue rooftops would have a longer history with the color. No mate, wrong pick. That is precisely the place where they made blue in the Bronze Age in Greece. I gotta say, academic research sometimes does have a sick sense of humour. And besides, in Mycenae, not only they used Egyptian blue, but they modified it, creating variations in blue through grinding the base material with varying amounts of quartz. Once again, for a colour they couldn't even see, they surely seem to demonstrate appreciation for different varieties of it. It almost seems to suggest that they saw blue like we do. From the prehistoric times to our time, colour information was interpreted first by our brains through our eyes and second by our linguistic systems through our cultures. The gradual transition from the prehistorical general consciousness to the scientific knowledge of the nature of colour phenomena is complex, but one thing is for sure. The relationship of mankind to the colour world is not just utilitarian. We don't just represent linguistically each colour as we actually see it all the time, as these creators seem to expect the ancients to do. Colour, in language, is not just about description, but also categorization. After reading ancient writers' description of the sea being dark wine coloured, stormy but never blue, honey being described as green, sure you might think the ancients were weird, why wouldn't you just describe something with its actual colour? We do it too. Let me prove it to you. Honey is described as green. I don't know about Homer, but if I saw green honey, I, I would not eat it. And we describe this wine as white. This is white wine. This is yellow, mate. Now imagine if I opened a bottle of white wine and instead of looking like this, it looked like this. I would not drink it. I'll drink this one though. I mean, people call these white grapes. This is green. I can go on. Different languages categorize color differently. Even though most humans perceive the same differences between colors, in linguistics, the exchange of descriptive colors for different basic ones is called type modification, and it's extremely common in most languages. When you use a type modification system, you use a more basic color term in order to classify things rather than describing them. We do it too, on a daily basis, and saying green honey is weird but white grapes is not is a double standard. Nothing weird under the sun. And talking about the sun, the sun in Old Norse and other Old Germanic and Slavic languages is considered red. 
Rother. And so is gold. And no, gold did not have a high copper content, if that's what you're wondering. Only low quality gold was considered yellow. Again, a phenomenon of categorization. Furthermore, not all languages have the exact same boundaries within the color spectrum when it comes to nomenclature. Let me prove it to you. Look at these two colors, one is red and one is pink. Would you all agree that these are two different colors? Of course you say. And yet, pink is nothing more than a light red. In fact, the word pink, which originally was the name of a flower, wasn't used in English to distinguish this specific pale tint of red until the 17th century. Now look at these three colors. To English speakers, these are all blue. To an Italian, this is blue. But these have their own names. This is azzurro and this is celeste. In Italian, in fact, if you wanted to convey the idea of the blue sky, you should say cielo azzurro rather than cielo blu. To a Russian, these two lines of the metro station are two distinct colors with their own names. To an English speaker, they're both blue, just like these two flags are both blue. And if we add green to our example, the situation becomes even weirder. Objectively, the distance between navy blue and powder blue is greater than that between blue and green in any chromaticity diagram. And yet in English, green is a different color, but navy blue and powder blue are both blue? Does that mean that you Anglophone speakers cannot see these different colors because you don't categorize them differently from blue? No. Obviously, this idea that allegedly William Gladstone proposed, namely that all ancient Greeks were colorblind, is wrong. Modern science confirms that ancient humans had the same biological systems for observing colors than we do. For a while, some suggested that maybe the ancient Greeks just saw colors different than we do, or maybe they were all colorblind. But we now know that color vision developed around 30 million years ago, so that's not it. The way the information is presented to us, it sounds as if now we know, but they didn't in Gladstone's time. Not quite. Grant Allen, a Canadian science writer and novelist, already did know in 1879 and he wasn't the only one, as he writes about the possibility of an absolute blindness to colour in the primitive man, he says, the development of a new sense over just 3,000 years is unacceptable in terms of biological evolution. Now, going back to the colorblind thing, there are an estimated 300 million people in the world with color vision deficiency today. One in 12 men are colorblind, sounds like a lot, but in the big picture that equals to only 8% of the entire male population on Earth. Moreover, only 1 in 200 women are colorblind, 0.5%. It just doesn't happen that an entire people are all colorblind. So yes, it's a silly remark, but you see the real problem here is the fact that William Gladstone never said that either Homer or the ancient Greeks were colorblind. In his writings, Gladstone argued that members of another culture might mentally categorize the world differently from us, without implying any change in the biological apparatus of human vision. Give him a little credit. And the funny thing is that when he wrote all this in 1858, he didn't even know what colorblindness was. Colorblindness was in fact first described in English in 1798, but it did not become a widely known phenomenon until far later. You can Google it. Google engrams it. According to Google engrams, the frequency of the bigram color blindness in British sources was essentially zero until about 1850, and then rose gradually to about 4 per billion bigrams until about 1890. Gladstone himself told us that he didn't even know what color blindness was in 1877, when he spoke about what he previously said in 1858. He writes, the curious phenomena of colorblindness had then been very recently set forth by Dr. George Wilson. So why is this myth about William Gladstone and colorblindness around? Because people are not familiar with 19th century word usage. Here is the incriminated passage. I conclude, then, that the organ of color and its impressions were but partially developed among the Greeks of the heroic age. You see, today the word organ certainly tends to suggest a physical element of anatomy, such as eye or heart, but in the 19th century it was frequently used to express a mental faculty. Example, faith, belief, is the organ by which we apprehend what is beyond our knowledge. Clearly in this context the word organ meant a mental faculty, an aspect of cognition. So, Gladstone's use of organ in the passage quoted did not imply that an aspect of the Greek's physical anatomy was underdeveloped. Indeed, in 1877 he says, Are we to suppose a defect in his organization, or in that of his countrymen? His answer to both questions was no. Let's get to the good stuff. You want to know why Homer describes the sea as wine dark? The word translated as wine dark is actually more complex 
than you think. This adjective, which in later Greek meant approximately purple or dark red, is applied to the following natural objects in the Odyssey and the Iliad. Blood, dark cloud, wave of a river when disturbed, wave of the sea, disturbed sea, the rainbow, and metaphorically, to bloody death. This cognate verb is applied to the sea darkening, as well as to the mind brooding. And this compound adjective is applied to wool. Compare all of these usages with the Homeric epithet for the sea wine-looking. Evidently, red wine really was seen as sharing an important visual property with the sea. But why? Well, maybe it was. Really think about it. It's like saying, Trees are green. Sure, trees are usually green, but depending on the season and the genus, some trees can be yellow, red, orange. Sure, the sea is usually blue, but it's not always blue. It can be green due to the floating sediments and particles in the water, algae, and plant life. But dark red? As someone who was brought up and spent most of his life in the biggest island of the Mediterranean Sea, I have seen with my own eyes the sea at dusk getting a dark red Color. But as we enter the realm of literature, the argument they couldn't see blue becomes as weak as it gets. Colours gain a symbolic value depending on their psychological salience or importance in that language. In violent literature, red is going to be prominent because of blood, but it goes deeper than that. Homeric epics are poems. They have their own metaphorical language, for instance, ominous passages and their inner meanings. Readers might get the wrong impressions and print it on a newspaper. Both in the Iliad and in the Odyssey, the sky is described as being bronze, and even iron, on several passages. In any case, it's unscholarly to just call them weird and ignore all literary explanations and come up with exaggerated ideas, like the one suggesting that maybe the ancient Greeks couldn't see blue. Look at these passages. Let's try and understand the analogy. The hooves of their horses beat up to the brazen heaven. So they fought on, and the iron din went up through the unresting air, to the brazen heaven. And now the sun, leaving the beauteous mare, sprang up into the brazen heaven to give light to the immortals, whose wantonness and violence reach the iron heaven. Iron is often used in the epics to denote anything pitiless, hostile, unyielding and inflexible. That includes, among else, the hearts and minds of warriors and funeral pyres. Literally speaking, those things have nothing to do with a metal called iron. It's the epic's metaphorical language. The bronze-like iron, it's used to denote the heart of warriors, Ares as the god of war, and the sleep of those who fell in battle. In non-ominous passages, brazen in this case denotes brightness. It could reflect the proto-cosmological view of the sky as a metal dome that covers the earth like a shield. It's an analogy, which made sense in the mind of Bronze Age people. The expanse being a shield that covers humanity. The association of the sky with weaponry exists in Roman literature as well. Lucretius uses the phrase Caeli Lorica, the armour of the sky. The sky is brazen because it is connected to the gods. In the epics, their palaces are indeed said to be made of bronze. The appellation may have its origins in the fact that the sky is where meteorites come from, and the very first iron ever used by mankind was indeed from fallen meteorites. Iron literally fell from the sky. Is it really that strange to think, then, that the sky was made of iron? No language on Earth is able to describe accurately the millions of colours the human eye is able to distinguish. If fidelity is what you're looking for, then only numbers have the level of accuracy you want. On a computer screen, we work with the RGB colour system, where each pixel has a mix of red, green and blue light. You can then represent nearly 17 million distinct mixtures of RGB light in terms of a six-digit hexadecimal code. Here are 14 different colours. Now, do you prefer D3, D7, 2, 6? Or would you rather buy a shirt in C8, CB28? Given they're very similar, but not exactly the same. I mean, I can be a little pedantic at times, but even I wouldn't make a whole debunking video to tell you that the colour that the XY YouTuber called EE814B was in fact D56E3C. The very fact that we don't have nearly the language capacity to express all the colour we see, and yet we still see them, should be enough to debunk the silly idea that the ancients couldn't see blue because they didn't have a word for it. This experiment goes back to a 2012 Radiolab episode about colours. In this episode we're talking about Jules Davidoff's research on colour perception. We are told about the experiment on Himba colour perception shown in the 2011 BBC documentary Do You See? 
what I see. Here is Business Insider's take. When shown a circle with 11 green squares and one blue, they couldn't pick out which one was different from the others, or those who could see a difference took much longer and made more mistakes that would make sense to us, who can clearly spot the blue square. But the Himba have more words for type of green than we do in English. When looking at a circle of green squares with only one slightly different shade, they could immediately spot the different one. Can you? As linguist Mark Lieberman discovered is that the experiment shown in the BBC documentary is nothing but a dramatization. It's not Davidoff's actual research. And even the results and the description of such results was completely invented by the authors of the documentary. It's the editor's work, not the scientist's work. What the papers really reported was only that the subjects experienced slower reaction time when distinguishing the oddball color. Not aware of any finding, and certainly none with the Himba, where a participant has failed to spot an oddball. Given this small but statistically meaningful difference in the color shade test is good science, but it wouldn't get you the views. Perhaps it wouldn't justify a whole documentary, I guess. Hence the lies. The Himba couldn't see blue, they make mistakes, they couldn't see it. And that's why a creator like this guy, who is really sounds like a nice guy, but he was deceived by the BBC. Blue. When asked which square looked different from the others, they couldn't tell him. As I proved before with blue, but I'm gonna prove it now again with orange. Orange in English as a distinct color is also a recent origin and it's relatively rare in languages. Chaucer described the color of a fox fur as, open quotes, betwixt yellow and red. He didn't have a word for it, but he could clearly see it. Peter Gainsford says people are misinterpreting the ancient Greek color words, and the terms kyanios and glaukos cover most of the color space denoted as blue in English. It's not that the ancient Greeks didn't have a word for blue, it's just that the ancient Greek words in question cover several colors that include blue. Athena's eyes is a great example of this. At the very beginning of the Iliad, Athena's eyes could range from green to blue to perhaps even shiny silverly. The ancient Greeks had words for the different shades of blue. They just did not seem to use one collective term for all varieties of blue. One true fact that most of these videos got right is the fact that language does seem to have a sort of evolutionary priority scale when it comes to the emergence of basic color lexicons. But then attached immediately after what is solid science is this statement. In birds, the intense blue that we perceive is due to the microscopic structure of their feathers and the way they reflect blue and violet light. This is known as structural coloration. Don't get me wrong, it's fascinating, but it's beyond the point. It's irrelevant. This statement is used to justify the supposed lack of vocabulary to say blue. The animals do look blue, but it's not a pigment, so it doesn't count, so there isn't much blue around us, and that's why the word blue didn't develop. But of course it counts. This is a pigment, this is not. Could you have told the difference if I hadn't told you? No, and neither could the ancients. You know how I know? Because I told you in reverse. This one, the mandarin fish, is actually blue because of a pigment, and its blue colouring is a result of a cellular pigment called cyanophores. Both of them still appear blue, pigment or not. You know how I know that people of the past couldn't tell them apart? Because of Old Norse literature. In all poetic descriptions, ravens are described as being blur. So blue. When you read the sagas in English, you'll find them described as black, but that's not a literal translation. Black is sferter, blue is blur. They are described as blur, which demonstrates that when people see blue, they think it's blue, whether it's a pigment or not. And of course, in the ravens, it isn't a pigment, it's structural coloration. Let's remember that all color is an illusion generated in a species specific way. Colors only exist in your mind. No object is innatively green or blue, that's just how you see it as a human. If I take a magnet called a transcranial magnetic stimulator and use it to inhibit area V4 on the right hemisphere of your brain, you will lose all conscious experience of color from your left field of vision. Remove the magnet and all color comes back. Colors need an information processing system to interpret them as color in order for them to exist. Sure, the electromagnetic radiation and its wavelength do exist, but colors are just our way to interpret them. Furthermore, to me, this is subtractively yellow. It absorbs all wavelength of light except for yellow light that then reflects back to my retina. To you instead, since you are seeing this on your screen, this is not subtractively yellow because your screen is not producing yellow light. It can only produce red, green or blue. The yellow I see and the yellow you see are completely different and yet they appear the same. 
Conclusion, it's easy to lie to the brain. This isn't yellow at all. It's the screen telling your brain a lie. You can't help but believe. And now, dear noble ones, at the end of this journey, I have a question for you. Is the sky really blue?